Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in on the IMSS webinar. Please call Dr. Daniel Cuneo. He's a pediatric gastroenterologist at Mercy One Des Moines Pediatric Breast Day Care Clinic, and he will be be presenting on NASLD and the pediatric population. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. But before I do, I just want to remind you all, if you called in, to, do, to please mute your lines as sometimes we get some feedback. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Daniel. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining over the noon hour. Um, hopefully most of you are able to eat a little bit of lunch while you listen. Um, so I've been uh, here at Mercy One. Uh, now it's been Mercy One for just a few weeks, but Mercy Medical Center uh, since August of 2005. And uh, before that, I did my training at the University of Iowa. And actually, one of the I'm going to present a, a patient in this uh, uh, talk that was from my uh, years as a fellow. Um, but since then, I've seen that my fair number of patients who've come in with uh, elevated liver enzymes, and, and most of them have had uh, uh, fatty liver. So this is sort of a, a practical approach. I, the talks I've done since fellowship don't have a lot of like scientific data. I don't do a big like grand rounds with lots of research and presenting papers and things like that. I kind of use it more of a the opportunity as a practical approach. What what these kids do in my what I do for them in my clinic, and hopefully um, that can um, translate to your clinics too. Um, kind of the everyday what you see, what, what do you do with the the patient who comes in, and um, but it is based in sort of a standard standard of care and. Uh, recommendations from our pediatric uh, GI uh, national group. So um, this talk is on uh, fatty liver in the pediatric patient, um, which is more common than you would expect. Um, just some three basic objectives. One is, to, and most of you probably know this, that there's a growing epidemic of obesity and subsequently uh, fatty liver uh, in the general population, but also in, in pediatrics. And uh, NAFLD just stands for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, know when to screen these patients and to determine when, if and when a referral should be made to a, a pediatric gastroenterologist. And I have no financial disclosures or other relationships to report. So just some definitions on how, how we classify uh, obesity. Knowing that BMI may not be the, the most foolproof way because you may have some very muscular uh, football players who have a higher than normal BMI, you would not consider them obese. But it's sort of the best reference we have right now for the clinical setting. So a BMI under fifth percentile is considered underweight, and um, we do get our fair share of those patient referrals. Uh, normal BMI is from fifth to 85th percentile. Overweight um, is between the 85th to 95th percentile. Once you hit the 95th percentile, it's technically considered obesity. And then um, there are even more severe cl uh, classes of obesity um, if your BMI is uh, greater than or equal to 35 or greater than or equal to 40, your class 3. Class 2 for 35, class 3 for uh, equal to or greater than 40. Um, it is a growing epidemic. Um, I've seen this just in the community and in my own practice. Um, with, so BMI greater than 85th percentile, again, is considered overweight. Um, the number is as high as 26% uh, in children between 2 to 5 years of age. Um, it's about a third in kids between 6 to 11 years of age and then up to 40% in the um, teenage years. Um, obesity, uh, you can see the numbers there. They're, they're less than what they are generally for just overweight, but they're still, I consider that pretty high for these age groups. And even class two, um, uh, you know, two out of 10, two to five-year-olds are considered a, you know, morbidly obese. Um, and that number kind of creeps up a little bit higher as you get to those teenage years as well. If you look at trends over uh, in our country, you know, from the uh, late 70s, um, the uh, percent of children uh, between 6 and 11 year old who were considered obese was 6.5 percent. That's up to almost 20 percent in the um, uh, early 2000, you know, the 2013 to 2014. And then the teenage years, it's uh, another significant jump up to about 20 percent. Um, there's probably many reasons. Uh, this I think this is rooted in some sort of um, research and science, but it's also my own opinion. I think there's tons of sugar-containing beverages out there, energy drinks. The um, capacity with which you can buy those energy drinks is, seems to be getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, they're not only little 8-ounce, 10-ounce cans anymore. You can buy 24-ounce bottles and carry them around with you. 
And then obviously I think, although technology has lots of benefits, I do think more screen time is, uh, can be a detriment. As well, there are other risk factors for obesity, and they're a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Um, studies have shown that if you have one obese parent, your risk, uh, the risk of the child is two to three times. If both parents are obese, it's up to 15 times. Um, they're also, they also see it more uh, in African Americans and African Indians and Hispanics. Um, uh, people of lower socioeconomic status uh, might have an increased risk of obesity that probably plays in the role of some education as well as, um, and this is unfortunate, but generally healthier foods seem to cost a lot more money than um, fast food. And then on the rural populations, you may see it a little bit more than in the um, suburban or urban areas. So this is a kid um, I saw back, you know, gosh, this was probably somewhere between 2002 and 2005. Um, but it's a typical story I see. So it's a 13-year-old male that came in with elevated liver enzymes. A lot of this workup was done before he got to our GI clinic in Iowa City, but he had an ALT and AST that were, the ALT was elevated, AST was probably just slightly elevated, if not close to normal. They had increased. Um, he had an ultrasound and a CT even, I think, before he came in that showed fatty liver. Um, someone had ordered a gallbladder scan, and he had negative HIDA scan for biliary dyskinesia. I think uh, he was on Ritalin for some ADHD, and they, the, they thought maybe his Ritalin was causing some elevated liver enzymes, so they stopped that, and the liver enzymes did not improve, so that got him uh, into um, our clinic. Uh, his uh, diet was horrible. I call it the Cheeto sign, and um, I remember walking in the room. I remember this family distinctly. Uh, he was here with his mom and grandma both. All three of them were very, very large, um, uh, and all, there was a bag of Cheetos in the room. He had the Cheetos cheese around his lips, and each of them were carrying um, pretty substantial sized bottles of Mountain Dew. So that's kind of the picture when I went in. Um, past medical history, other than some ADHD and asthma and depression, uh, nothing, uh, that, that is significant, but nothing else. Um, Mom, maternal grandmother, maternal great grandmother had morbid obesity. Um, a further history that I didn't include here, uh, they told me that a, a great grandfather had died from a liver disease, uh, cirrhosis. And when I asked if he was an alcoholic, they said no, he never drank in his life. When I asked how big he was, he was uh, between four and 500 pounds. Um, but he, that's how his great grandfather had passed away. Um, review assistance, he had some constipation with ankylpresis. On exam, he was uh, fairly large for his age. Um, ALT was elevated, AST was pretty okay. Other workup um, was unremarkable. He did autoimmune workup. Um, we looked for alpha-1 and the trypsin deficiency. He had um, screened for Wilson's disease. We checked his uh, amylase and lipase. Um, glucose was fine, and we did an A1C, which was normal. Um, he ended up getting a liver biopsy, and that showed uh, severe steatosis, so lots of fat. He also had some inflammation. Um, Bile ducts were fine. He had some mild fibrosis. Um, and the diagnosis after the biopsy actually went for, um, was more of a, now a steatohepatitis. And we'll talk a little bit more. He went from more from a NAFLD fatty liver to actual NASH. Um, at that time, he was uh, started on some ursodiol, some vitamin E, and we encouraged weight loss. And I'll talk a little bit about these, these therapies, interventions. Uh, he came back heavier. I think if you remember his weight was 98. This is 104.7 kilos. So we usually probably followed him. I think we saw him probably four months later. Liver enzymes bumped up. Um, it was really it was kind of frustrating, um, but well, we just reinforced our original plan and uh, the need to change his diet habits, exercise, and try to lose weight. So some definitions. So non-alcoholic fatty liver is uh, Consider fatty liver if you have at least 5% steatosis without inflammation. And, and these are in people who don't, you know, don't usually consume alcohol, which is most of the pediatric population um, generally. Uh, obviously, you've got to get your history in your teenagers, but um, most of the, the, our population does not drink. It becomes NASH if you have the fatty liver with cellular injury. Um, so, and then... That chronic inflammation will lead to fibrosis and then eventually cirrhosis. So then you can get NASH cirrhosis. Um, this is a, and I have a, the next two slides are actually bigger versions of these, but this is a picture of fatty liver. So you have the uh, ballooning hepatocytes with lots of fat globules. These are just nuclei. And then this is NASH. Uh, uh, this is NASH where you actually have lots of inflammatory cells, these dark 
um, cells, are, and then you have the, the fat, and you actually see some, some fibrosis. And again, NAPLT, so you don't really see much inflammation or fibrosis. And then with uh, inflammation, see lots of inflammation, all these um, uh, inflammatory cells here interspersed with all the fat globules. So some background. It, it really is um, fairly new in the, in the terms of uh, medical history uh, di diagnosis, um, really unknown before the 1980s. In fact, my, my wife's a physician. When I told her I was giving this talk, she, she kind of commented, she's like, yeah, didn't that really become popular during medical school days? And, um, and she's right. I mean, the di diagnosis has really become more prevalent over time. So back in the late to 80s to mid-90s, um, uh, NAFLD was 47% of all chronic liver disease. That had bumped to 63% in the um, early 2000s, and then late 2000s, it's up to 75%. So 70% of all the chronic liver disease, at least um, in this country, is due to fatty liver. Um, and it is the most common liver disorder in the Western industrialized world. Uh, you'll see it more in people with central obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, people with dyslipidemia syndrome, uh, and metabolic syndromes. Um, in the U.S., up to 46% can have, will have um, fatty liver, and uh, up to 5% may actually go on to having uh, steatohepatitis. And um, it appears to increase, uh, the incidence of NAFLD appears to increase with the uh, increasing obesity. Um, and some of the literature in the pediatric literature, up to 35% of obese children and adolescents may have a fatty liver. Um, but then you may also see up to 7% of the general population. Uh, even So you'll see some instances of fatty liver in, in lean children. It's rare, but you may see that. Um, most are diagnosed after the age of nine, which this will go into sort of when to screen kids. Um, and, but it has been reported that fatty liver in as young as two-year-olds, and there have been reports of children as young as eight who actually have developed cirrhosis. When you start getting younger diagnoses of, of um, if, if you have someone that you, under nine that you suspect and have fatty liver, you actually have to do more of a workup. You can't just assume it's fatty liver. But it, it can just be that, rarely. It can be considered part of the metabolic syndrome. Uh, other terms are syndrome X or insulin resistance syndrome. I'll be quite frank, in my clinic, I don't really get into much of this. I usually just kind of focus on the, the liver aspect of it. Um, and if there is some dyslipidemia, I don't treat um, hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia. I usually will refer that to the, the primary pediatrician or family doctor if they're comfortable. If not, sometimes our cardiologist will, will treat that. Um, as well as a hype, uh, hypertension. Uh, there are clinics that have, uh, for lack of a better word, obesity clinics. I'm not quite sure what the technical term is for them, but they multi-specialty will probably have GI and uh, nutrition and, and other subspecialists involved with these kids to try to help them go through a, a day of, um, of, of visits and, and trying to help them through this. As I said, you can also see it in lean people who have some insulin resistance. If you remember, our patients, A1C and glucose were normal. Um, we won't go through all the slides, but there are five definitions of metabolic syndrome based upon um, different organizations. So at the top, you have the uh, National Cholesterol Education Program. Um, this is the uh, International Diabetes Federation. Um, the, uh, down below, which, that's the group of, for the study of insulin resistance, the WHO. They all have different criteria for um, what would meet the diagnosis of a metabolic syndrome. And part of that includes what your glucose levels are, cholesterol level, if the obesity, um, uh, their definition for obesity if there's high blood pressure. So I, I honestly don't use this, um, but it's out there for people and um, to utilize if, if they're in those types of clinics, these multi-specialty clinics that are trying to take care of these patients. Usually what will happen is I'll get a referral. There will be um, somebody is checking labs. Um, either because they suspect it because the, the patient has type 2 diabetes, or more commonly I get referrals because patients are getting their yearly physicals and part of, or screening physicals for sports, and they get liver functions, and they're elevated. And they'll get sent to me. And usually the workup uh, for other rare disorders is negative. Um, but up to, eight, up to a quarter of these kids may have elevated autoimmune markers. Um, there's, so, there's certain um, tests for autoimmune hepatitis that include like an ANA, anti-smooth muscle, a double-stranded DNA, or um, there's one called liver kidney microsomal antibody. And if some of these patients, up to 25% may have elevated autoimmune markers, if they do, 
um, they need to you need to do a biopsy in these kids to rule out autoimmune hepatitis because um, obviously the treatment will be much different. But those who don't have autoimmune hepatitis but have some just elevated autoimmune markers, they may have an increased risk of fibrosis and inflammation um, uh, with their non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Usually the ALT is two to three times normal. I check both AST and ALT, but ALT is probably just a better lab to trend out of the two. Um, but it's not a great predictor for severity. So you may have somebody with a mildly elevated ALT and severe uh, fat deposition in the liver, and then you may have some kids who have really high ALTs and you know they don't show any, uh, they have fatty liver but no uh, inflama no infl uh, inflammatory changes. Using ultrasound, I, I order. It's not a, uh, um, I think one of the slides I had will say it's not really a good screening tool, but I, I use it um, to um, look. If I have somebody that suspects uh, their overweight child with a high ALT, I'll always order an ultrasound just to look for an echogenic fatty liver, but also making sure that they don't see like um, significant scarring or any kind of evidence of cirrhosis. And then you can also look at the gallbladder and look for um, any bile duct dilation, things along those lines. So it's a useful tool. Um, this is just a kind of a busy algorithm, but I'll, I'll kind of follow it down. So usually most of the patients I see start up the top here, come down, come down, and then come down to the right side here. So this is usually um, the children greater than 10 where NAFLD is more probable, and then I kind of go down this algorithm in my practice. And this is just the, the most common scenario. If, um, if you have patients that are, you know, less than 10, obviously less than 3, who have elevated liver enzymes and an um, abnormal ultrasound, you really, NAFLD is less likely the cause, and you really have to start looking for other things. So these kids probably should be referred sooner to GI than later. Um, the 3 to 10-year-olds, NAFLD becomes a little bit more common, but still not as probable as children, um, great, you know, 10 or greater. Um, so you should do some other work up in these kids, um, looking for viruses and, and things along those sort. And, and maybe get them referred uh, sooner as well. Um, but if you have a 10-year-old overweight patient who has a fatty liver uh, on ultrasound and has elevated ALT, um, recommendations are you can probably just follow these kids, do some weight reduction. If still persistent after a few months, then um, refer them to GI. Do more labs yourself or refer them to GI for um, more further workup. Um, and then eventually get getting down to a liver biopsy if if, uh, if warranted. That's how how I kind of usually do it. If I strongly suspect fatty liver, and I see them for the first time. I I usually won't even do other significant workup like like done over here. I'll um, encourage them to lose weight, exercise, have them come back in about four months with repeat liver enzymes. If they're um, if they continue to gain weight and their liver enzymes are are, are the same or worse, I still will encourage another you know, healthy eating and exercising, have them come back maybe one more time in four months. If they're still not any better, then at that point just probably biopsy. If they come in for the follow-up and they have lost weight um, and they've really adhered to a, a good healthy diet and exercise with a and stabilized weight and their liver enzymes have not improved, then I'll usually start doing a little bit more workup with regards to labs. Um, I'm still a little reluctant to pull the trigger to do a liver biopsy, but, you know, if I've been following them for 6 to 12 months and the liver enzymes just aren't declining, I may do it at that point. Um, so the screening recommendations per um, NASP again, this is our North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. So this is our main um, uh, academic board or uh, collegial board. Uh, the recommendation is any child with a BMI of 95, 95th percentile or greater should be screened. And uh, usually it's just checking um, initially in a uh, liver hepatic function panel. Uh, they suggest anyone with a BMI at, at least 85 um, with other risk factors, so signs of insulin resistance, a family history, or family history of NAFLD, or maybe people with undiagnosed liver disease or, or death from liver failure, these probably, kids should probably get screened sooner. Um, screening should, be, can be, should be, uh, begin between 9 to 10, 11 years of age. That would we'll go back to that slide we had mentioned. Um, uh, because this is where it most commonly will present, and usually just checking the AL, ALT, but I would just check the full hepatic function panel, because with that you'll also get like a GGT, which can look for any kind of biliary obstruction or um, obviously a total and direct bilirubin.
So if the ALT is uh, above the upper limits of normal but less than 80, the recommendation is to repeat an ALT in one month. Um, if the ALT is persistently greater than two times upper limits of normal for three months, then the, the recommendation is you refer to PHGI. You should do it uh, sooner if the ALT is greater than 80 or if there's other worrisome signs or symptoms. So if they're having jaundice, easy bruising, easy bleeding, um, uh, you know, things are right upper quadrant pain, things along those lines you would want to uh, send sooner. Um, although hepatic ultrasound is not a good screening tool, I think if you have a patient that you suspect has fatty liver and they do have elevated ALT, I do think it's useful getting that um, to look and get some imaging. So the, the patho pathology of non-alcoholic uh, non fatty liver disease, it's a spectrum of disease. It usually starts with some steatosis which can then move along to hepatitis. And obviously, as you know, chronic inflammation can lead to uh, fibrosis and scarring, which eventually can lead to cirrhosis, and then finally liver failure. I um, rarely, I can't remember the last patient, if any, we got to this, these last two stages. Usually it's um, somewhere in these first three stages. Um, obviously, the adult literature is going to be different, and that population is a lot different, and there's other issues that could be playing a role as well with alcoholic use, uh, alcohol use. Um, it's rare in peds to develop uh, cirrhosis from NASH, but it can be seen in up to 25% of uh, adults with NASH, um, and up to 10% of those people with NASH can succumb to liver-related death. Um, and usually having obesity and diabetes will increase your risk of fibrosis. So um, I think, let me see, these next, well, that, that slide here. So this one here could, um, you know, this might not be a bad idea to break out to some patients who just are not getting the, the clue and, and um, you know, following through with the regimen. So the two types, two main causes of steatosis, non-alcohol and alcohol. Um, and then, you know, this will lead to either non-progressive uh, steatosis and no inflammation or inflammation. And usually this happens um, from oxidative stress with cytochrome, uh, to cytochrome P250, uh, and then that will cause inflammation, healing, and then scarring. Scarring will lead to cirrhosis. Well, then you can then go down to carcinoma and death, and then or portal hypertension and death. So this, you know, I haven't used this, but um, actually I just found it in preparation for this talk probably about a, a month or so ago, a few weeks ago. But in those patients who just aren't getting it, you know, you might show them that this can happen, and this is what will happen with untreated inflammation of the liver. Um, it would be considered a two-hit hypothesis, uh, like in a lot of diseases. Um, first is you have insulin resistance, which will cause fat um, collection in the liver. But accumulation of fat alone is, not, is a benign course. It does not, that does not, um, is not where the problem lies. There's no inflammation with that. But, uh, um, Unchecked lipolysis will result in free fatty acids and lipid-laden hepatocytes, which are then primed for a second insult, which is uh, oxidative stress. So you'll get some oxidation of the free fatty acids by the mitochondria. This is kind of a busy slide, but basically it's the development of uh, uh, free radicals, um, um, drop in vitamin E. So this is where um, vitamin E therapy might be helpful as an antioxidant, um, but basically it's Oxidation of fatty acids causing oxidative stress, increased uh, oxygen radicals, um, increased inflammation. Increased inflammation leads to fibrosis, cell death, cell injury, cell death, and then cirrhosis. Again, just another busy slide. One of the things I wanted to point out here is um, this TNF-alpha. So uh, TNF-alpha is a, a big topic in my practice with regards to um, treatments for inflammatory bowel disease. So you use tumor necrosis factor alpha blocking agents to try to treat IBD. Um, there's been some uh, uh, proposals to maybe use this to treat um, uh, steatohepatitis. hepatitis. By blocking that, you maybe block inflammation. I, I don't use it. I've never used it. I have no intention of ever using anything like that. Um, but that's where uh, that was the purpose of this slide here. But then also you can kind of see it's just a, it's a sequence of events and cascade of eventually leading to inflammation. So treatment um, is really, uh, it's difficult. Um, and I, I, I kind of put good luck here as a joke, but also it's the reality of it. Um, 
uh, the biggest thing we can do for these patients and that they can do for themselves is really trying to manage their weight. Healthy eating, exercising, trying to lose weight, get their BMI down. That'll be the best treatment for them, um, especially since the two I mentioned, ursodiol here and, and, and vitamin E, really don't, may not have significant benefits. Um, vitamin E maybe will help a little bit more than ursodiol, but um, not as much as what weight loss and, and exercising and um, healthy eating will do. Um, the thing is, ursodiol and vitamin E are pretty safe um, and really no significant side effects. So there was, uh, this is an older study. Um, they took 31 children and they broke them down a diet alone. They gave just uh, uh, ursodiol. They combined ursodiol with diet and then they had their untreated controls. And what they showed, the diet alone determined weight loss and improvement of AST and ALT. Adding ursodiol to the diet um, had no benefit whatsoever. It didn't increase the benefit. Um, and ursodiol alone was ineffective with no difference compared to controls. Um, what they showed at the ultrasound, they showed some um, improved. So not only did the labs improve with the weight loss group uh, with their diet, but um, the ultrasound findings, so the, the echogenic liver findings improved to looking more like a normal liver without the fat deposition. Uh, and those study um, took 166 patients with uh, actual biopsy-proven steatohepatitis and randomized them to placebo or ursodiol. And then they checked LFTs every three months, and then they did a repeat histology after two years of therapy. So let's see, that was of those 166 patients, 126 finished the study. And out of those 126, 107 actually had uh, their second biopsy, pre- and post-treatment biopsy. So what they saw was that those who were on ursodiol did well. They, it was well tolerated, no side effects. Um, the body weight was generally stable during the study, so no significant change there. Um, they showed that the ALT and AST was stable to improve in both groups who were on um, ursodiol versus um, uh, no, uh, placebo with no statistical difference. And they saw no difference with regards to change in degree of steatosis. So they biopsy those both groups um, who were on ursodiol and who were on placebo, and they saw re no real change in the degree of inflammation. Um, so essentially, ursodiol really didn't, there's no side effects, but it really didn't do much to improve their disease. With regards to vitamin E, there was one study that took 11 patients. I mean, these are small numbers. Um, but these kids were less than 16 years of age, and they had NASH, um, and they were treated with uh, vitamin E for 4 to 10 months. And their BMI did not change, but yet their ALT, they showed, had dropped um, from 150, well, 175 average to 40, and the AST had also dropped. Um, and their levels, while they were on vitamin E, remained pretty stable to normal. But when they came off the vitamin E, their levels, um, ALT and AST, increased, suggesting some um, re reoccurrence or rebound inflammation once you took away the um, antioxidant. Um, but ultrasound showed a persistently echogenic liver, so the liver appearance did not um, change. Um, on imaging studies, and these I do not think they re-biopsy these kids. Um, they're not a great study, but um, did show some drop in enzymes. Um, so some of the um, other treatments uh, besides ursodiol and um, vitamin E, and more importantly, healthy eating and weight loss with exercising, uh, lipid lowering agents, so uh, statins, um, have uh, been utilized. They're not, there's not great data in any of these that would show a significant um, benefit beyond, again, uh, eating, healthy eating and exercising. Metformin, and again, I don't, I don't use these therapies, so if, if primary doctors are wanting these done or um, patients are wanting me, to, parents are wanting me to start these, I would defer back to the primary or, you know, maybe consider endocrinology or having a cardiology uh, look at these kids who have um, hypercholesterolemia. The uh, anti-TNFs, these are like uh, infliximab, adalibumab, uh, those treatments, but um, I've not seen anything really new, at least in the pediatric literature, for using these. Um, so in, in summary, uh, obesity and NAFLD are, are definitely on the rise. I think it's, um, it's a significant problem. I think communities would benefit from um, having, uh, in a bigger community, at least a an organized multi-specialty clinic with um, GI, endocrine, 
osteopathy cardiology if there's dyslipidemia, um, nutritionists, dietitians, um, kind of, uh, and with their the general pediatrician and family practitioner to kind of help these people with a multidisciplinary approach. It, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to lose weight. It's hard to break old habits and and eat healthy. Um, but I, I think this is a, a really significant problem in our society. And I think as we continue to get bigger, we're going to have more and more um, a fatty liver, and then in the pediatrics, there's going to be more and more NASH. Um, and and I think that age where it's more common is going to start getting skewed down lower and lower eventually. So uh, it definitely is a problem. Um, insulin resistance and obesity do increase your risk for this, obviously. Um, we talked about the general screening and select patients. So I think, you know, if you have a patient who's otherwise healthy but is uh, really overweight uh, based upon the BMI, I, even if they're healthy, I think starting around nine years of age, they, those kids probably should have an hepatic function panel checked. Um, and if elevated, ALT, then should have an ultrasound. I would not do an ultrasound as just, you know, without doing the, the liver functions. I would get the liver functions first if they're normal. I don't think you need to do an ultrasound, even if they're really overweight. But if their ALT is elevated, then I would get the ultrasound. And in those kids who are generally healthy with no other risk factors, um, I don't think they need to be um, referred to GI at that point. We'd be happy to see them in our group here at Mercy One, but um, I think it'd also be fine if, you, if they're given some counseling on healthy eating and dieting and educating um, on exercise and weight management and then maybe repeating the um, labs in about four months. Um, and if you're still, um, you know, if they're still elevated that, at that point, especially if they have lost some weight and dropped their BMI, then definitely at that point I would refer to GI. Um, but you can also argue that if, uh, if they're elevated and the kids are continuing to gain significant weight, you might even consider waiting another, you know, few months and and then, you know, the third set is still elevated, then refer at that point. But we'd be happy to see them at any time. Um, obviously, if you have a very young patient who um, uh, has elevated liver enzymes be lower than the typical age range for fatty liver, then you know, we'd like to see those patients sooner. Um, if you have a, a, the typical age range patient with, fatty li with uh, suspected fatty liver, but there, there are other things going on, other risk factors, easy bruising, bleeding, uh, an unusual family history of um, unexplained liver disease, you know, we'd be happy to see those kids as well. Um, vitamin E and, and uh, Ursodiol are um, safe but, qu you know, questionable benefit. And, and honestly, I, I don't even use them in my office here. Um, I, um, I, I think, you know, I just, I, I don't want to, part of it is I want to try to get these children and families to, to get away from the idea that you can treat with a drug and things will get better and we don't have to modify our behavior and eating habits and exercise. So, um, it, it's kind of, I, I guess, uh, serendipitous for me that these drugs don't really work well because then I don't feel guilty about not recommending them and, and trying to force the issue more with change your lifestyle, get involved with the YMCA or some sort of exercise program, and try to lose weight because I think that's, that's the best option for them. So I don't even uh, use these um, therapies. Um, and again, the ultimate goal, if, if it's not obvious enough, I haven't said it enough, is really to... Um, just eat healthy, change your habits, and it has to. It might have to be the entire family needs to change their eating habits, um, and you know, get a partner with them. It's hard to do it on their own, so a lot of times I'll encourage one of the parents, especially if that parent, and there's a good chance, is also overweight. To, as a team, they try to do this together and be accountable, held held accountable to each other. Um, that that can, can kind of help. Um, so there are there are references there, but. Uh, I'm sorry this is so short. I thought it was going to take at least 45 minutes. So I, apparently I talk really fast into the phone, and I apologize for that. But um, that's all I have. I don't know if, if there's a way, way to answer questions or ask questions. So I'm getting a little feedback, and it sounds muffled. So can you repeat that? There are questions. Can you hear okay. me now? Yep. Great. And are I'll they? just read them off. Yeah, can you feed them? I see. Can you hear okay? Oh, there. Hi, Rochelle. Dr. Gammon's on. Okay, great. Um, I can see the questions. If you want to answer those. Just type them in 
or answer all, I can answer oh, I can answer just on, online. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Gammon, how are you? She she had uh, asked how often would you recommend screening ALT for obese kids. So I think you know if you have that nine year old obese patient, um, definitely do a screen at that point. If uh, if the ALT is elevated um, and the rest of the hepatic function panel is normal, get an ultrasound if it shows just typical fatty liver, then um, I'd be happy to see them many times, so would my partners, but I think it would also be safe if you kind of counsel them on healthy eating, exercising, and then having them return in four months and repeat the liver enzyme, the hepatic function panel. And if there's no change in the enzymes um, with or without um, weight stabilization, then, well, let me see, let me take that back. If, if you repeat the enzymes and they're, they're not changed or they're worse, yet the kid is still just gaining too much weight, you can maybe do it again for another, you can probably follow them for another four months or so, really stress the importance of it, um, have them come back at that point if, if they're still elevated at that point. So that would be the third time you've checked, and um, then I would just send them to GI at, at that point, definitely. Um, I would especially send them sooner if they have really, uh, you know, listened to you and tried to lose weight and, and did a good job of me at least not gaining more weight, and their liver enzymes have not improved. Even with a second check, I think if, if that happens, I would, you can send them to GI, um, and then we can kind of talk and maybe go through other potential um, etiologies with some more labs and talk about liver biopsy if we think that's necessary. Um, so what if they're normal, should you check? So then Dr. Gaiman asks, if they're normal, should you check yearly? That's a good question. I think um, that would probably be fine. I think, uh, you know, just yearly with their yearly physicals I think is fine. Um, I guess I didn't see a recommendation if your initial check is normal, but it, to me it just would make sense if you have um, in any of your patients over the age of nine that you follow once a year for yearly physical school physicals, if they're you know still um, at that um, overweight obese level and they're not managing their weight properly, even though they had a previous normal hepatic function value before, I guess I, I think it'd be safe to check them once a year. I don't think it'd go more frequent than that. You're welcome. Tell Andrea I said hello. Um, have you, and then, uh, doc, is this Dr. Cordovi? Um, so uh, have you ever needed to report the family to Child Protective Services for noncompliance with obesity and apple? I have not. Um, that's a very good question. You know, we, we all worry. We see kids in our clinic here, and you guys probably do about, uh, kids who are failure to thrive because parents aren't feeding them. And, and we don't think twice, you know, about um, if that is persisting, referring those patients to um, Child Protective Services. But it, you, an argue, to be, argument can be made if, if on the other end of the spectrum, if uh, parents are um, letting these kids lead a horrible sedentary lifestyle and just feeding them junk all the time and they're to the point that now their um, excessive weight gain is causing significant um, health problems, should that be uh, neglect of care and be referred? It's a good question. Um, I have not. I, I, I honestly try to avoid that part of uh, medicine. I, I hate it. Um, but I think an argument can be made, and I don't think anybody would, um, at least in the medical community, would, would judge harshly for, for doing that. I think you, you, you have to kind of be a little careful. I think you should probably um, do all you can to counsel this family and really try and, and have a good relationship and follow them. But I think, you know, if you ever, if your gut's telling you that this is a um, necessary, I don't think you would at least, um, at least make the, make the threat, I guess, for lack of a better word, or at least uh, mention that this is a serious consideration and people have been reported for this, so we really want you to try to, to adhere to this plan. But um, I have not, but that's a very good question, and, and I can argue, you can probably argue that easily, that that would be uh, worthwhile. You're welcome. I think there's no more questions coming in, so we'll wrap that up. I want to thank you again, Dr. Danilo, for 